Welcome everyone to the ICN, ICNC webinar series. Uh, my name is Maciej Bartkowski and I'm Senior Advisor in the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. I have a great pleasure of moderating today's webinar on civil resistance tactics in the 21st century. I'm delighted to host Michael Beer, who is our key guest speaker, and two discussants, Dr. Peter Ackerman and Shaska Bayer, who will respond to the main presentation. Michael's talks will be based on the ICNC monograph that he authored with the same title, Civil Resistance Tactics in the 21st Century. This monograph can be downloaded for free from the ICNC website. So uh, please use this opportunity to also access and read uh, that great piece. Uh, when Michael reached out to us a couple of years ago with the proposal to update Gene Sharp's famous list of 198 nonviolent methods, we immediately thought that uh, this will be an exciting and very important project to support. Uh, Sharp's 198 methods became a popular tool and widely accepted reference point for both educators and activists alike. It was used, for example, to show whether and to what extent campaigns and movements were diversifying the tactical repertoire, which categories of tactics were predominant in a nonviolent struggle and whether the resistors were anywhere near to having exhausted, exhausted the available list of nonviolent tactics. As we know, Sharp published its list of 198 nonviolent methods in 1973. Since then, we saw hundreds of nonviolent campaigns that emerged around the world, often challenging very brutal regimes. These campaigns were coming up with truly innovative tactics derived from people's own ingenuity, ingenuity and strategic skills. We, need, uh, we, we knew that a truly Herculean work will be needed to document these new tactics and uh, make some logical sense around the categorizations. But we believed in uh, Michael's skills and enthusiasm to deliver on, this, on, on his proposal. And he didn't let our hopes down. We have now an excellent monograph with a universe of new tactics and a compelling categorization of this amazingly diverse human activity. We believe this exceptional monograph written by Michael uh, will be of a great resource for people who considered using nonviolent resistance to win their rights. His work will also be an excellent learning and training tool for those who want to see activists being ever more successful in, in achieving their goals. And I truly believe this webinar is going to demonstrate Michael's exceptional work. I would like to uh, remind everyone uh, that we are live tweeting from the ICNC Twitter uh, at Civil Resistance, and people can share their reactions using hashtag ICNC webinars. I would now like to briefly introduce our main speaker. Uh, Michael Beer serves as the director of Nonviolence International, a very reputable Washington, DC based nonprofit that promotes nonviolent approaches to international conflicts. Michael has been with uh, Nonviolence International since 1991, and together with his organization, he serves marginalized people who seek to use nonviolent tactics, often in very difficult and dangerous environments. He has, work, he has worked with diaspora activists, multinational coalitions, global social movements, as well as with activists inside numerous countries around the world. Michael has a special expertise in supporting movements against dictators and supporting global organizing and mobilization for social justice sustainable environment and peace. After Michael's talk, I will introduce our two discussants who will offer their reflections on the, on, on the presentation. So now, without further ado, I would like to ask Michael to take over from me and go ahead with the presentation. Thank you, Mache, very much for that lovely introduction. I hope I can live up to uh, your uh, introduction. Uh, I want to thank you and your team for helping uh, produce this wonderful publication. I want to also speak on behalf of perhaps this large audience we have today to thank ICNC. Uh, ICNC is, for the last 20 years, done an unbelievable job of creating an incredible resource uh, set of resources for the world. Uh, in so many languages, for academics, for journalists, for scholars, for activists, um, for teachers, and uh, you've really had an enormous impact uh, in the world. We don't like 
you've never tried to take the limelight uh, and we always put the, the activists and the people on the ground first, but these resources have really made an enormous amount of difference and we thank you so much. Um, there have been a remarkable number of staff people that have contributed to this that I've worked with. Uh, I want to shout out to uh, Maria Stefan, Hardy Merriman, Jack Duvall, Darren Cambridge, Shaska Byerly, Steve Chase, Mache, uh, uh, Bartkowski, you, Althea Middleton, Detzner, Nicola Barach, and many others. Uh, obviously, uh, we can't leave out Peter Ackerman, who uh, for whom this is a brainchild. He's funded uh, this substantially, and he's also a scholar in nonviolent struggle and made important contributions in, in his own right. We wish you all the best in the transition that ICNC is going through, but because you've never had a public forum where you're being thanked, I just wanted to say thank you because I know a lot of people on this call are really, really thankful for what you have done and what you're continuing to do, and I know we're all going to work with you to make uh, ICNC uh, successful and its mission to to create a better world successful. So thank you very much. I want to also say thank you to Nonviolence International team that has helped me so much in doing the database and collecting all this information. To Mubarak Awad, uh, the founder and dear friend who really encouraged me to write this book. I want to send a special thank you to my mother, Fran Beer, who passed away unexpectedly on Thursday, and to my father, John Beer, both of whom so profoundly shaped who I am and my passion for social change. Gene Sharp it deserves a huge thank you. Uh, his work has changed the world and many of the lives of people's lives on this call. I want to thank him for endorsing my effort uh, to update his research. And finally, I want to thank the huge audience here today. Uh, I want to thank those of you who supported Nonvance International financially because we uh, made this database all in a volunteer effort out of general funds. And I want to thank all of you out there today for coming today. You're leaders in nonviolent activism. You're really focused on empowering disenfranchised people around the world. And it's an honor to spend time with you. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts and comments today. The title of the book is uh, Civil Resistant Tactics in the 21st Century. The book is only 105 pages, but there's so much more content in there than I can cover in a presentation. I'm going to talk briefly about why I wrote the book and some major ideas in the book, and then I'm looking forward to Peter and Shaska's uh, uh, comments and, and presentations. Then we'll have a grand discussion with all of you. I wrote the book. It's really quite simple. Uh, Gene Sharp's book is 1973. People are still talking about 198 methods, even though we have so many more methods that are known that have been uh, not cataloged or done since uh, that time. And I wanted to try to update also some scholarship and experience from the field uh, to see if we could uh, find out what ways we could improve our understanding of nonviolent tactics today. So that's what we're trying to do. I'm trying to do a supplement to Gene's book and uh, that's, nobody else is doing it. And I jumped in to say, okay, it needs to be done. So that's really quite simply the reason. So um, what is civil resistance? Uh, civil resistance is really frankly just mass nonviolent action. A more precise definition is here uh, provided by Véronique Doudouet, uh, a tremendous scholar uh, and, and activist in her own right. Uh, and she basically says here in more technical terms that uh, it's, it, it's not mass action that includes electoral, legislative, and judicial kinds of institutions. And it also doesn't, of course, include armed struggle and violence. So everything else is this vast area we call civil resistance. Um, I like to think of civil resistance in tiers or levels. You have the tactical level. You then have the campaign and strategy level. And then you have the movement grand strategy um, level. and they it's valuable as an educator to think in the levels of, of uh, resistance and how tactics relate to campaigns and movements. What is a nonviolent tactic? 
Um, I'm going to read here off the screen. This is something from Gene Sharp's uh, uh, language. Nonviolent methods are akin to nonviolent weapons and are the many individual forms of action. Tactics can best be understood as discrete methods or nonviolent tools deployed to achieve a limited goal. Uh, although the distinction between method and tactic can be useful for research purposes, the use of the word methods in English is often an obstacle to public understanding of civil resistance because tactic is widely used to mean both method and discrete action with a goal. We use the word English word tactic instead of method to facilitate public understanding. Um, sorry, I skipped. The two main points of the book are the we've collected 346 tactics of non civil resistance so far, of which 148 are new. And the other major point of the group, uh, the book, is that we've come up with a slightly tweaked categorization building on Gene Sharp's work to understand the universe of nonviolent tactics. We've done that into constructive and confrontational uh, uh, columns and, and categories, and we base it on the three mechanisms of nonviolent tactics. The repertoire of nonviolent tactics is huge, and we've only touched a small part of it so far. There are going to be many more tactics to add to the database. And if Bruce, if you could add now the uh, database website URL in the chat, that would be great. Uh, we've collected 346 so far. We have photographs for some, examples for all, and we'd love uh, your help in, in adding to this and completing this database and, and making it a living database. Um, the first one, I'll, I'm going to go through just a few examples we have in the book and on our database. They're just, I can only do a few handful. One is from the digital revolution. We have surveillance now. You see a picture here of uh, uh, during the Arab Spring in Egypt where people are uh, pointing their laser lights and illuminating a helicopter that is surveilling them from above. Sue is the French word for below. And this is where people, mass movements are using their digital technology to surveil the authorities and the corporate uh, uh, institutions from below. Uh, a very poignant example recently is the uh, surveillance of the killing of George Floyd, in which we had citizens taking video of that killing and sharing it with the world. Uh, and so surveillance is a vast technology that's very, very powerful. Uh, but we also see governments and corporations using surveillance uh, to uh, uh, attain their own uh, uh, goals that are not always in line with what the people want. Uh, Casserolazzo, meaning casserole in English, is was started, invented with, to the best of our knowledge in Chile in 1971 by women. Uh, it has been reused recently in Burma uh, in the month of uh, February in protest to the coup, where people bang pots and pans at eight o'clock every night on a vast scale throughout the country. And um, in the Burmese context, it also meant chasing away bad spirits, and they also used it to alert people when the police or military were coming into their neighborhoods. This particular photograph is uh, a protest in Colombia. This is now a widely used tactic around the world. Die-ins have been around for quite a while, uh, but weren't cataloged in, in 1973. In this case, we have a photograph from the Sackler Museum at Harvard University, where people are protesting the naming of the uh, museum after the Sackler family, which profited off of the, the death and suffering of so many people from the opioid epidemic. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we categorize this in as a human body, medium of the human body. There are a lot of subcategories of categorizations I won't be able to go to here in this presentation. Um, this divestment is uh, something that's hard to take a picture of. Uh, so we've taken a picture of people that are proclaiming divestment. This was really popularized in the 1970s during the anti-apartheid movement of South Africa 
where people and pension funds and others, institutions, universities were pressured and did withdraw their funds from uh, an ownership in corporations that were doing business in South Africa. This picture here is uh, Extinction Rebellion calling on uh, various institutions to withdraw their ownership and their uh, cooperation of their uh, uh, from corporations, the fossil fuel industry specifically. Um, divestment doesn't usually have a terribly uh, strong uh, financial impact. It's primarily uh, a symbolic uh, uh, effect. Uh, mic check is a uh, type of uh, activity that was popularized during the Occupy movement of 2011. Uh, without a microphone, people use a call and response type of uh, communication to greatly uh, uh, amplify the message uh, across a crowd. It's now used in a theatrical way uh, in various uh, performances or, or protests uh, as a way to express uh, a joint, a, a loud joint voice together. Uh, finally, I have critical critical cycling, critical mass cycling. This is uh, a picture from uh, Budapest. And this is something that we categorize as creative intervention. This is where people are trying to create the future today. We call it prefigurative uh, action, where people are trying to create the future today. In this case, people are uh, uh, soon to be there riding on the streets, taking over the streets and saying that bicycles need to be the primary form of, of transportation, not fossil fuel uh, burning vehicles, and uh, that the, the world needs to change uh, and it needs to change today. Uh, you can read about many, many more of these uh, tactics uh, in the book and in the database. At this time, we'd love for you to contribute to our database. We're going to drop a form in the chat window where you can add new uh, uh, tactics that you are aware of that you'd like to be categorized. But we really need photographs uh, and uh, examples, additional examples, so that people around the world can see these uh, examples and, um, and uh, understand the tactics better. So the second major point of the book is to talk about the how we classify this enormous range of human behavior, and it's it's a challenge because it's it's so enormous and the categories are a bit leaky. But you know, whenever you're simplifying uh, uh, reality and human humankind, you're going to have uh, uh, this kind of leakage. What we've done here is we've built on Gene Sharp's work substantially. On the left-hand side, we've characterized uh, the range of human behavior as what people say, and uh, Gene Sharp talked about this as uh, expression or protest and uh, persuasion, uh, what people don't do or not doing, acts of omission. Uh, and then uh, the third tier of is uh, doing or creating something. Um, and in very simple terms, this is on the left-hand side, you can see manipulation of resources. This is what people, this is how nonviolent tactics work. People take action and they control or manipulate resources to uh, accrue power. And they usually do it either through confrontational or through uh, constructive uh, action. And so this whole uh, chart here uh, is uh, predicated on the three mechanisms of nonviolent tactics, which I substantially borrowed and tweaked from the work of Doug Bond. And coercive uh, actions, as you can see, are those that impose costs or threats on an opponent. And the constructive persuasive column are those kinds of uh, mechanisms there in which you use persuasion, rewards, appeals, and we also include competitive modeling or uh, constructive program, basically out competing an opponent. The Burmese right now have a parallel government that they're forming and they want the people to, to follow the parallel government and not the military government. And so uh, using these three big mechanisms of manipulation of resources, coercive or confront, uh, confrontational action and persuasive and constructive action, we've created a universe of non of cataloging that we think is very helpful for people to understand. Um, uh, 
well, there is a brand new category that emerged out of this, the refraining category. Someone has recently said we should call this the cooperation category. And this is unusual. It's not been really studied before. I hope somebody will do a PhD thesis on this area. Gandhi did this in the, in the 19th century where he called off a, a train strike uh, uh, that he was going to do against the British. And this has been done by transit workers recently here in the United States where they called off a, a, a strike that they started as a unilateral reward to the public and to the uh, adversaries uh, to go back to the negotiating table. Uh, and so it's a rare kind of technique they used, but it does uh, fit here as something that people don't do but has uh, some sort of positive or constructive uh, out, uh, output. Um, why is there so much growth and in innovation in nonviolent tactics? I talk about this at length in the book. Uh, I'll mention a few here. Digital technology, obviously, I think everybody here is aware that in the last 50 years, digital technology has uh, done two things. One, it's a, it's a communication uh, mechanism on a vast scale. And so there are all kinds of ways of expression uh, using the arts and video and music and all kinds of things to express one's opinion uh, and to mobilize mass public action. Uh, it's done something else. It's also, as Dr. Joyce has indicated, it has amplified ordinary, what we're traditional nonviolent action. Somebody can do a single protest in a public square, hold up a video, and it can go viral and millions or billions of people can see it. So it's an amplification also of traditional nonviolent tactics. Um, Art-based and cultural resistance is something that uh, uh, has been going on for thousands of years. It wasn't cataloged very well in, in 1973. Uh, with the help of uh, Nadine Block and others, we've tried to really expand this uh, area of, of documenting nonviolent tactics. And uh, it's just an extraordinary arena. Uh, here we have the Sudanese who had an incredible nonviolent resistance campaign against their military in 2019 and defeated a 30-year brutal military dictator who was an Islamist and it's uh, and it was a secular substantially secular revolution it's really incredible what they achieved and the arts played a very major role singing puppetry here and others human rights activism really uh, blossomed in the 1970s uh, Amnesty International is very well known at that time for really growing and uh, a lot of activists around the world now operate from a framework of human rights defenders and a human rights framework rather than a nonviolent activist uh, per se. Uh, and this is a very powerful frame. It more is closely tied in with legal uh, and legislative remedies and institutional remedies, but there are lots of tactics that you can be find here on the new tactics of human rights uh, database that we have uh, that overlap with nonviolent action and we've included in our database guerrilla lawyering is one that we've taken from them and it's a very exciting uh, uh, movement this human rights defender movement the diffusion of knowledge about civil resistance has definitely uh, played a role in tactical innovation in the growth of nonviolent struggle around the world uh, I have a number of different uh, groups here are the Nonviolence International Training Archives of Rutgers, which is the largest training archive in the world, ICNC, which is, has the just unbelievable training ar uh, and educational archive uh, in so many languages um, for so many groups. We have uh, Canvas here uh, at Meta Center doing Gandhian uh, education. Uh, we have Beautiful Trouble, which we were a co-founder of and, and is an extraordinary toolbox for activists around the world, and Waging Nonviolence, which we were a fiscal sponsor of and is now one of the best places to get nonviolence news uh, and discussion in the world. These are just some of the great websites and efforts going on, but it's not just websites. These have been efforts to actually uh, uh, get activists, scholars, teachers, trainers uh, informed about uh, current knowledge about nonviolent struggle, and it's diffused substantially from scholars, trainers, activists, journalists, uh, to the general population around the world. Uh, there's been tactical innovation from women and the sexual minorities. Women have been using uh, nonviolent struggle for thousands of years. 
uh, and uh, have continued to do so and be very innovative in the modern era, and along with sexual and gender minorities. Here we have a glitter bombing of a Mexico City official. Uh, this has been substantially uh, started by gay and lesbian activists in the 1990s as a technique. Um, and then finally, uh, and there are many more in the book, resistance to the rise of global corporate power. Uh, multinational corporations have uh, don't have a lot of uh, uh, restraints on their activities, uh, and there are citizen movements out there trying to restrain uh, uh, global corporate power. And um, in particular, the extractive industries. So you have all kinds of interventions and the point of extraction interventions at the point of decision here at a corporate headquarters, interventions at the points of transportation or at the consumer points. We have a picture here of environmentalists dressed up as turtles uh, protesting the World Trade Organization. So those are some reasons why we've seen innovation and growth in tactics and this extraordinary uh, movement in our lifetimes uh, of people rising up to meet their needs. This is one of my last slides. Uh, the boundaries of nonviolent uh, uh, action and civil resistance are a little bit blurry. Uh, and I discuss this some in my books, things like property damage, negotiations, uh, psychological attacks, everyday resistance. These are fascinating areas of, of social change and, uh, and can at some points be included in civil resistance tactics and at some points not. And there are a whole lot of PhD theses that could be written on a lot of these topics and the interplay with nonviolent civil uh, resistance and would hope that uh, we can learn and develop these uh, understanding of the relationship of the boundaries of civil resistance going forward in, in our lifetimes. The goals of this book, I hope this will inspire uh, and promote action. Uh, if people around the world know that there are hundreds and hundreds of tools and things that they can do, this might uh, get them beyond their despair to take action. I hope it will deepen scholarly understanding, particularly the three mechanisms of nonviolent action that I've outlined uh, that I think uh, uh, help us understand how nonviolent tactics actually work and function. And then uh, we hope this book will and database will help educators and trainers by giving them new tools and uh, to provide for people on the ground. And then finally, improve strategic planning. If people are running campaigns, if they have a larger toolbox and, and a toolbox they can understand better, uh, we hope that will really improve strategic campaigns of various kinds. Finally, uh, uh, I'm into nonviolent action and I don't want all of you to be passive uh, so there sitting uh, in your seats. I wanna offer an opportunity for you to be active uh, uh, which is the essence of nonviolent action and civil resistance. And that means please help us, meaning ICNC and NAMAS International, get this book into classrooms all over the world. Uh, and please help us grow this tactics database. Claim it as your own uh, and give us examples, photographs, uh, and new tactics to include. And finally, we're going to have a organizing meeting on April 14th. If you would please drop the Google form in the chat here, please fill it out. We really need all of your help to try to get this uh, book and database widely uh, distributed around the world because nonviolent tactics has been neglected, in my opinion, uh, compared to nonviolent strategy and movement uh, uh, education. And we really need to get information about nonviolent tactics, updated information to people around the world, and your help in doing that is really essential. So with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks and say it's been an honor talking with you, and I'll hand uh, the baton back to Maciej. Thank you, Michael. What a great presentation. What a truly amazing compilation and depiction and categorization of the new tactics of civil resistance. Thank you. That's a tremendous work. Uh, so I would like to now introduce our first discussant, uh, Dr. Peter Ackerman. And um, Dr. Peter Ackerman is the funding chair of International Center on Nonviolent Conflict and is one of the world's leading authorities on nonviolent conflict. He holds a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and is also a co-author of the two seminal books on nonviolent resistance 
a force more powerful, a center of nonviolent conflict, and a strategic nonviolent conflict, the dynamics of people power in the 20th century. Dr. Ackerman was the executive producer of an award-winning PBS TV documentary, Bringing Down a Dictator, that discusses how a nonviolent youth movement brought down Serbian dictator Slobodan Milosevic. He was also the series editor and principal content advisor for the two-part Emmy-nominated PBS TV series, A Force More Powerful, which charts the history of civilian-based resistance in the 20th century. Dr. Ackerman is a prolific speaker on nonviolent conflict, appearing in various national media outlets. He is currently completing a phenomenal book project, A Checklist to End Tyranny, How to Win a 21st Century Civil Resistance Campaign. It will be soon available from the ICNC Press. Peter, it's a pleasure to host you here. Please go ahead with your reflection. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, congratulations. I think nothing illustrates more poignantly how overdue your work is when you, in the next to last slide, juxtapositions Gene's second volume on the methods with your work, and there was a 48-year difference. Now, one thing worth reflecting on is that the world has changed dramatically in these 48 years, and one way to think about this change is the growth in complexity of every institution, social, cultural, economic, governmental, and the increased level of dependencies every one of these institutions have on its so-called supply chain. Well, when you have these high levels of interdependencies, you also have more and more opportunities for disruption. And as we know, disruption is the mother's milk of nonviolent conflict. And so it is wholly logical for you to be able to categorize a proliferation, a dramatic proliferation of tactics over the last 49 years. And, and again, thank you for doing this. I'd like to offer a couple of observations. First, and this is just a way of looking at it. Nonviolent conflict can be divided into two types. Uh, the first is over issues. So when we think about social justice movements, for example, they are really focused on issues and they are more likely to exist in countries with, with Freedom House scores or in the top half of the Freedom House score listing. They have more potential for positive some results. So for example, same-sex mar marriage movement, which is incredibly successful in the United States, I'd say most Americans feel that this was a win-win for everyone. And um, they also um, don't have this strong sense of who the adversary is. It's more what the issue dispute is over. Uh, the other kind of conflict is over pure power. And this is more likely to occur in countries in the bottom half of Freedom House scores where you're dealing in a conflict over power between citizens and tyrants, authoritarians, dictators. They are more likely to create a zero sum result with one side ending up with more power and the other side ending up with less. Uh, in the first case, when we talk about nonviolent conflict, we talk about social and economic justice movements. Here, the better appellation is civil resistance campaigns or maximalist campaigns. Now, the reason why I make this distinction is because if you look at Michael's list, incredibly comprehensive list, some of the same tactics might be designed differently in a social justice movement vis-a-vis -vis a civil resistance campaign against tyranny. Uh, you might you might think about a the impact of a um, of for example a uh, a strike, a mass strike, in terms of who it's affecting, uh, which might be very different. Uh, and might be very appropriate in a uh, in a social justice movement versus a tyranny where you might design the strike for much more much more intensive outcome. Now, Maciej mentioned that I I am finishing a book called The Checklist to End Tyranny, in which I am focused on maximalist campaigns. And what I want to do is also spend a second uh, talking about three categories of tactics in those campaigns that might be useful to think about. The first is 
categorizing tactics according to the risks to the dissidents who are in competition with the tyranny or the dictator. And here I'm using a distinction authored by Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth, where we talk about tactics of concentration, which are more risky, and tag versus tactics of dispersion, which are less risky. The other way to think about these tactics is in terms of the dilemma created for the dictator or tyrant. So we can create a tactics of commission where we are doing things that the tyrant needs us to stop doing to maintain his legitimacy versus tactics of omission where we stop doing things the tactic the the tyrant needs us to continue to maintain his legitimacy and the last category has to do with tactics of whether the tactic for either party is offensive or defensive so for example an offensive tactic for a tyrant would be violent repression a offensive tactic for a um, civil resistor would be one of the 340 plus tactics that Michael has listed in this book. Um, now, one final thought is that whether you're dealing with a nonviolent conflict over issues or nonviolent conflict over the allocation of power, the most important thing to recognize that in each of these conflicts, the battle should be recognized to be taking years, not months, not weeks, and certainly not days. And if these conflicts don't have these three ingredients in them, they're likely to lose. And where they are is a unity of purpose and leadership, the concept of planning and sequencing many tactics, because in both these kinds of nonviolent conflicts, no one tactic will be successful because the opposition will figure out a counter and uh, and you need to diversify tactics. And the final ingredient required is nonviolent discipline. Whether you're in a uh, battle over issues or a battle over power, nonviolent discipline is critical. Loss of it, it's hard to imagine where that's a positive. Um, if these features don't exist, we winning a nonviolent conflict a social justice movement or an economic justice movement or a battle over tyranny is unlikely to succeed. So um, let me stop there and, and let's hear what Chaska has to say. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you for that reflection. So yes, uh, let's let's now introduce our second discussant, Chaska Bayerle. And uh, she's a veteran researcher, writer and educator in nonviolent action, focusing on anti-corruption and accountability, as well as gender and nonviolent action. She's uh, right now a senior fellow at the Terrorist Transnational Crime and Corruption Center in Shar School of Public Policy and Government at George Mason University. She was previously a senior research, res, research advisor and Jennings uh, Randolph senior fellow at the Program on Nonviolent Action at the US Institute of Peace, and is the author of a widely read and distributed among activists book, Cartailing Corruption, People Power for Accountability and Justice. Ashaska, please go ahead with your reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mace. Uh, thank you very much, ICNC and Peter, for this opportunity to uh, be a discussant in this uh, really exciting launch of Michael Beer's Civil Resistance Tactics in the 21st Century. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, and I think we all acknowledge this too, um, I'd like to acknowledge all the people around the world um, who are engaging in nonviolent action for justice, for rights, for human dignity, uh, for um, various kinds of freedom. And um, we are learning from all of them and all of you. And so uh, whatever uh, reflections I may have, uh, in a way, are reflections of the the courage and the capacities and the extra, extraordinary um, achievements of people around the world. Um, I'd also just like to say, um, and don't laugh everyone, but I'm speaking in a personal capacity. And um, whatever I say is not um, in any way to be attributed to any organization or group that I'm affiliated with. It's solely my own opinion. Um, so moving along, because I have a few minutes, um, 
And I could say a lot about this new publication uh, and Michael's uh, extraordinary work, uh, but he's made a major contribution to our field of nonviolent uh, action and civil resistance. Um, first, and you may have all noticed this, the categories are very simple to understand. And this is really important because there's no reason to make something complicated when it doesn't have to be complicated. And especially when we're thinking about a work uh, and concepts and uh, terminology that can be translated into other languages. So kudos to Michael for coming up with some very simple, uh, translatable, but very valuable ways to think about and distinguish nonviolent tactics. Um, second, he pointed out something in the, the monograph that context matters. And I think this is a really important point that we need to remember. Nonviolent tactics are not about copying. So we may see uh, people demonstrating in one country. That doesn't mean that in another country, we may want to start demonstrating immediately. Context plays a very important role. And that is where not, uh, Michael's uh, ca classification of tactics can be very useful because it can help us think creatively and differently about the range of activities that people can engage in that can collectively wield power or wield pressure, whether it's social, economic, political, um, or even psychological. Uh, so there, he also, I wanted to raise something else that he, he pointed out in the book, which I think is very important, uh, that he said there are two considerations to choosing or creating tactics. That is appropriateness and efficacy. So when, you, uh, when, when we are thinking about tactics, if we consider the appropriateness of it, the efficacy and our own context, that's where we can really start thinking about um, doing things differently perhaps than what the adversary or the other side is expecting from us. And um, he pointed out something else really interesting in the monograph um, that actually, when we think about who are the protagonists of nonviolent tactics, in civil resistance and nonviolent action, we often forget that elites can also be protagonists. And when I say elites, I mean people with vested authority. That can be people in government. That can be people in parliaments. That can be even in some rare cases, security uh, forces. It can be people in different agencies in the government. Um, so this is also something and he gives very interesting examples. And this is something we need to think about when we are thinking about either against authoritarian regimes or backtracking democracies or struggles for that are related to social justice and dignity or struggles against corruption and uh, impunity. And so he gave some interesting examples, but I'd like to give you an, uh, an example from the present, which is happening right now in the country of Myanmar, other, some people call it Burma. So there is a mass struggle going on now against a extremely brutal military coup that happened in February. One aspect of that struggle is, struggle is called the civil disobedience movement, which is actually a movement of people who, who are working within the government, in the state. These are civil servants who are either not working or who are not carrying out all their activities uh, as they would normally. And so here's an example that we, for, that we often forget, that we can have people within the state or within corrupt institutions who can actually be protagonists. And how can we think about uh, creating tactics that they can engage in? And that's, again, where Michael's distinctions and new sort of framework that he's created can be very useful. So when we think about, for example, anti-corruption struggles, which is you know, the, one of the, the types of struggles that are very close to my heart, um, I'd like to think about how can we apply that? Uh, how can we apply some of Michael's uh, new framework for tactics. 
and I'll just give you one example because I'm not, I'm not, I should not be talking too long. The floor needs to come back to all of you. Um, there is a kind of um, tactic that Michael would call surveillance, which he discussed. In the anti-corruption realm, we call that monitoring and watchdogging. And that can be um, monitoring and, uh, for example, parliaments and members of parliament, government agencies, budget, either budget allocations, budget decisions, budget implementation. It can be monitoring the judiciary. It could be monitoring the implementation of laws, for example, anti-corruption laws or laws that prevent uh, corruption or laws that increase transparency and access to information. Um, all of these things can be, according to Michael's categorization, coercive in the sense that we were watching for things that people may or institutions may not be doing right. However, using Michael's categorization of coercive versus constructive, we could start thinking about how could we use constructive elements of watchdogging. So if we're going to watchdog, for example, or monitor, why not also monitor things that people with vested authority are doing properly, that they're doing with integrity, that they're doing and not cheating or stealing or abusing their power for some other kind of political or social gain. Um, so that's an example of how we can start thinking a little differently. And in fact, we can even combine the two. Michael does mention this in the monograph that sometimes a tactic can be either coercive or persuasive or constructive, and sometimes it can be combined at the same time. So watchdogging, for example, can be at the same time watching for things that are we could call wrongdoing or watching for things that we could call right doing. Um, and I would just like to end with one example. Michael talks about a new category that he calls reframing. And he said, we don't have too many examples of that, but there are some examples from the anti-corruption realm. And I'll just give you one in a couple of sentences. This comes from a group in Serbia called Serbia on the Move. This is an innovative hybrid NGO. And by that, I mean a non-governmental organization that combines community organizing and nonviolent action with synergistically with the functions of a traditional NGO, such as research, analysis, policy recommendations. And in a series of nonviolent action campaigns that they launched over several years to impact corruption in the public health sector, they found at one point in time, one of their campaigns was to uh, increase patients' access to information about doctors. For example, citations that they might have received, uh, cases of corruption, things like that, that patients would want to know about their doctors. And they engaged with the doctor, the medical association, and they made certain demands, and they were going, they were ready to launch a campaign of a citizen campaign of nonviolent action to pressure the medical chamber to their to accept their demands. What happened? They didn't. They called it off. They didn't do it because the 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 knowledge of that pressure, without even happening, basically created a situation in which the medical chamber acquiesced to their demands. So a very interesting dynamic. Anyway, I'll end there. Thanks for your attention and um, hand everything back to Mace and Michael and Peter. Thank you, Shaska, for this uh, insightful reflection of Michael's work. And uh, I would like to bring, I would like to ask uh, Michael and Peter to come in as well. So we've got kind of uh, the full panelist here with us. And, um, and I wanted to ask first, uh, Michael, if he has some uh, you know, insights, reflections on what he heard from uh, our discussants. I have so much to say, but I want to hand it off to the floor for most people. Uh, I I agree with everything that has been said by the discussants, the fascinating areas, uh, contributions to this. Context obviously is enormously important, and 
uh, what can be a nonviolent tactic in one context isn't even a nonviolent tactic in another, uh, and that these tactics can range a lot, as uh, as Peter and Shaska have both said. Um, so I really like uh, the fact that Peter started off talking about how the world is so much more complex and we have so much more interdependency uh, and that this increased interdependency uh, on each other creates the opportunity for disruption and uh, mass mass action that can can uh, change uh, power. I'm not quite sure I, I agree with uh, Peter's distinctions between between issues and uh, kind of uh, maximalist um, uh, struggles. Obviously, there's some differences there, uh, but even in the case of issues, we are talking about power. We're talking about the power of marginalized people often who uh, don't feel like they're being treated equally and they want to get legislative legislation or court decisions or whatever, the rule of law, where things change so that their needs are met better. And so they are fighting for power, and I know Peter would agree with that. Um, so uh, what I'm not doing in the book is I'm not talking about a lot of this strategic stuff. There's so many books on it. Peter's coming out with a great book on it soon, talking about co uh, concentration and dispersion and commission and omission and offensive and defensive in all the different kinds of contexts. And you can look in the uh, uh, Shaska's work about tactics in the corruption field. And she has a whole range of tactics that I have not even included yet. Um, so um, uh, I haven't really talked about the strategic application of tactics because that's an immense number uh, of books. And um, uh, I would just finally say in terms of Shaska's work, She's really pressing on what do we, uh, to me and, and all of us, on what is what is nonviolent action. In the past, we've really only called direct action uh, is what Gene Sharp and I have categorized as nonviolent action. But this has a very simplistic understanding of the universe of how conflict operates. And if we, many of you are familiar with the spectrum of allies, where a lot of what our conflict is about is not necessarily uh, the opponents, uh, the extreme uh, wings fighting each other, but who is trying to grab the the neutrals in the middle, the the public, the vast public that is maybe in the middle of a conflict, and who's going to shift them to their side? And a lot of the techniques that uh, Shaska has brought up in the anti-corruption movements are those that are not so much focused on the adversary because everybody's corrupt. They're focused on trying to change society and changing the. The, the, the vast bulk of the public and key sectors that are perhaps neutral and shift them over to uh, the side for, of the people. And so we haven't included a lot of those, like making donations. Uh, we haven't included that as a form of nonviolent direct action uh, because it, traditionally it was something that was only, uh, you know, that wouldn't do that uh, in terms of an adversary. So there's a lot of rich arena for us to discuss about what tactics we might want to include going forward in uh, nonviolent civil resistance. And a lot of this comes down to context. With that, I'll stop and hope to hear some of comments and ideas from the audience. Sure. Uh, before I open the floor uh, for the questions, Shaska, Peter, would you like to add anything um, to what uh, Michael just said? I'd like to echo Mike's desire to get to the public so they can have a chance to uh, express themselves. Yes. Great. Um, I've heard enough so, from me. So. so then award how we can uh, hear from our public. Uh, you can raise your hand and uh, we will go through the list of uh, our attendees and, um, and we will call on those who would raise their hands to ask their question live. We'll also be checking our uh, question um, uh, tool uh, where you can type your questions and we can then read this question to, uh, to the presenters. And uh, while you are deciding on um, whether you would like to ask the question, I will start with, with the first question that could be you know, for everyone to address. Um, and it's touching on the issue of the strategic application of tactics, Michael, unfortunately. That's okay. But uh, we have to get to the bottom of that because if I'm an activist and you're asking me to read your you know, 150 page book, I want to know what I can get out of that in order to improve the odds of winning my campaign. 
Um, so um, basically, my question is how identification and collection of this impressive number of new tactics and the uh, refined categorization can help, can boost, um, uh, and can can support those key features that Peter mentioned and just also elaborated briefly on, which is unity, strategic planning, nonviolent discipline, defections. How basically looking in the just into the simple, you know, new tactics or new categorization of, of tactics, refined categorization can help me better plan uh, for having a greater kind of unity, um, uh, more robust strategic planning, more robust nonviolent discipline, or greater chances of, you know, of uh, uh, soliciting defections. So um, it's a question to Michael, but I'm sure Peter and Shaska might have some thoughts on that. And then uh, while we are addressing that question, we will also check on the participants and the uh, questions to you guys. The book is 105 pages and it has a fairly narrow mandate, which is to focus on the classification and diversity of tactics and their innovation. The strategic deployment of tactics is enormous. There are so many wonderful books about this and new books coming out about this. And so, you know, no one book is going to have the answers to uh, the enormous field of nonviolent uh, strategic and res civil resistance and, and action. So this book is fairly narrowly, like Gene Sharp's book too, is fairly narrowly focused on uh, the diversity and classification of tactics. I also uh, focus on the mechanisms of tactics to try to help people understand if people are really understanding how tactics actually work in the in reality. What are the ways they work? I believe this is fundamentally important understanding for for all kinds of activists going activists going forward. Clearly, I think just the great uh, increasing the toolbox is going to help activists with the grasp number of uh, different kinds of tactics in lots of different categories. And I haven't mentioned lots of subcategories uh, that we've come up with that uh, I think are helpful for people to understand the range of tools that are available uh, for them. But when it comes to questions of dispersion or concentration or commission, uh, well, commission and omission is in the in this, but uh, other types of uh, uh, sequencing, uh, tactics, uh, what kind of tactics go well with other kind of tactics. This is so contextual um, that uh, my book just, it would be a, a thousand pages long. And so I would encourage people to go to other books for the strategic deployment of tactics to a significant degree. Uh, I'm maybe I'm being overly modest, but I, I, I just, tried not to jump into too many of these uh, questions um, uh, that you're asking me now. <laughs> I have lots of opinions about lots of these things, but um, uh, I hand it off to Peter or Shaska for any other response to that. Again, I'm, I'm anxious before time runs out to get questions from the, uh, from the floor, you know, so I'll, I'll pass until I get those. So. Okay, uh, so let's let's go then to questions from the audience. So um, I see, and I would like to ask uh, um, the person that I will uh, unmute to introduce uh, yourself and uh, your affiliation, and then ask your question. So I see the hand raised uh, from uh, Kata Kadriana uh, Rafitoson. Uh, please, uh, will unmute you. Please uh, introduce yourself. Just a second. Please go ahead. You are unmuted right now. Hello? Kataka Diana? Can you okay. hear me? Yes. We can hear Hello. you right now. Yes, Hi go everybody. ahead. So my name is Kay. I'm from Madagascar. Hello, Shaska and all. Uh, I'm one of the former alumni of ICNC, so I'm very pleased to be here today and very pleased as well to learn uh, such amazing things from Michael Beer and his book. So I just wanted to say that the idea of bringing this book in cl into classrooms is really needed uh, and it is very doable uh, because I think that most of activists are also teaching in universities. That's my case. 
uh, I'm teaching uh, to students in a Master Two of Political Science, and I'm teaching non nonviolent civil resistance. So we usually used Jean Sharp's book. But this one is pretty new, and I will for sure include this into my curricula. And I think that uh, if we spread the, the word around the world, um, with the alumni of ICNC, for instance, and others, then we, we can do great things together about this. And I had a question for you. Uh, we are living under unprecedented times with the COVID-19. Do you think that some new tactics have appeared during this very problematic year. Something that you will add to your list, for instance, or new um, kind of improvements from activists around the world. I was just curious about that. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Thank you. I can answer the last question. Yes, indeed, uh, we have a small section of the book where we talk about uh, one of the reasons for the growth in tactics has to do with natural made disasters or human made disasters and people's response, mass movement response to them. Uh, and there are a number of uh, things that have come up during COVID, including the, the use, uh, the massive and creative use of caravans. And I have a few other examples I can't remember of, of creative response to COVID um, uh, and, and the, the natural, if you want to call it, or human made disaster that uh, of COVID. We've also seen all kinds of mutual aid efforts that have erupted after hurricanes and, and other kinds of natural disasters that have created all kinds of new institutions and new ways of people helping each other outside of government, outside of institutions, uh, uh, mutual aid kind of efforts that are very interesting types of tactics for people to meet them, their needs and to change power dynamics. I, I would just add that uh, Ke from Madagascar is very modest, and in fact, she could add to your um, uh, list uh, a number of act nonviolent tactics that she and uh, citizens are engaging in in Madagascar around corruption in uh, COVID, in handling the COVID pandemic. Wonderful, wonderful. Great. Um, Okay, let's let's then go to uh, the next uh, uh, person who would like to ask a question. Uh, this would be Scott Badenkov. Uh, Scott, I will unmute you. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Michael, for going through with this uh, even after your recent loss. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I know folks who are reluctant to support this work because they're afraid that it can be used for evil, you know that that these tactics could be used by um, the anti-abortion movement, by the Tea Party, or you know even to block people trying to vote. So, um, should we be trying to keep this material from falling into their hands? Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's a, a great uh, question, and it's up to you how you want to handle this material. At Nonviolence International. We're generally of the opinion that uh, we want to get tools that empower people uh, of a variety of different uh, uh, ideologies and approaches. And since uh, built into nonviolent action is the idea that you're trying to do action without harming another, um, uh, you're maybe harming their interests, but you're without physically harming another person uh, and, in, uh, and trying not to do severe psychological damage to another person. Uh, that built into this, uh, because we have these uh, ideology built into this these tactics, uh, we're hopeful that uh, most of the time this will result in, in positive outcomes. But there's no question that, uh, that what we call nonviolent actions, a lot of these tactics in very different contexts can be used to harm people. Um, and how you distribute this is generally up to you. But I'm glad you raised it. I don't. I don't have a full answer. Maybe Peter or Shaska have have one. I, I like to address that for a minute. Um, when when people come to us to talk about civil resistance or social justice movements, what we try to do is ask them in their own terms to link what they're doing to their overall objectives. And what tends to happen is the objective, the acts that this gentleman is talking about that are concerning, become sort of um, 
I wouldn't say irrelevant, but they 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 lose their enthusiasm over them because when they actually think through what the ultimate value is to them, they actually aren't as good as they think they are, and and it makes them rethink what they're trying to do. In general, uh, movements that are pro-democratic, pro-human rights are more susceptible to creating successful nonviolent campaigns, whether for social justice or for um, what I call campaigns against tyranny and dictatorship. But I don't think it's wise to basically take categories of people and exclude the sharing of the knowledge because you're concerned with what they might do. That's sort of how we think about it here. I don't have anything to add. I think you both um, said everything. Okay, so let's uh, let's go to the next uh, 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 next person. Uh, it's Esther Sol uh, Solomon. Uh, Esther, I will unmute you, and please ask your question. Esther. Okay, uh, we we don't hear her, so. I will go to the next person. Uh, it's um, Philip Bogdondov. Um, and uh, Philip, I will unmute you. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Philip, are you there? Okay. Okay, let's try. Uh, one more time with another person uh, that raised their hands. Uh, it's Omar Lopez. Uh, Omar, I will unmute you and uh, you have to unmute yourself and please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can hear you. go ahead. Hi, my name is Omar Lopez. I, <clears throat> I work with the Latin American Center for Nonviolence and it's a pleasure for me to to salute Chaska, we we met many years ago. So good to see you, Chaska. And, and also Peter, I had I had done some things for ICNC, uh, translating book to Spanish. And, and I have two questions. The first one is for for Michael. Are there any plans to translate this book to Spanish? Because it would be important for large audiences in in, in Latin America. And the other question is. Uh, I work with um, activists in Latin America and activists in Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, which are, you know, they are uh, environments, practically they are totally controlled by the government. And I agree that context is very important. So my question is, are there any specific tactics that can be used specifically in this kind of environment or, or, or we should approach this book to try to adapt the tactics that we consider the best to the specific environment? Michael, can I take the answer to the first question? Yes, sure. ICNC will translate this into Spanish. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, ICNC. Wonderful. Uh, the second point is, uh, I don't have, uh, I don't have uh, advice uh, for you uh, based on this work. Um, the knowledge uh, that the people have in their regions about their conflicts and their contexts are so great, and so much more than I might have. That um, you know, we can provide the the tools, uh, examples of the tools from all over the world, but uh, I, I just don't know enough, uh, frankly. Um, and I, I, I hope that's not overly disappointing. I know people want, you know, answers. <laughs> and you may come away with a book with more questions than answers, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rich book with a lot to th that would, I think, provoke somebody to think very creatively about the kind of tactics they might use. Okay. Um, I agree. Uh, 
Good. So I will uh, also ask Said Rashid Ali uh, to introduce himself and ask uh, his question. Uh, Sally, Said, I have I muted you. You you have to also unmute yourself. All right, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Michael. Um, I have uh, one a question regarding the inclusion of tactics, whether the Khudai uh, Khidmatgar movement of Bacha Khan, if the author has studied that and got anything from that, first and second, uh, some of the followers of Bacha Khan, uh, whenever he was on movement and he was uh, arrested by the authorities, uh, so some of the followers usually used to go to the authorities and say that whatever he done and you are not accepting that and you imprisoned him we also saying the same thing so we should also be imprisoned and in this way yes, uh, they were trying to uh, fool the uh, prisons uh, so is there any material or any tactics from that movement yes and is there any chance of translation of the book into urdu and pashto <laughs> thank you very much thank you said michael peter shaska please go ahead well both shaska and michael would remember that gandhi used the tactic of flooding the jails and so did jim lawson in the nashville situation so what this gentleman is talking about there's ample precedent for it as to those languages, we'll get to it for sure. It might not be the first languages we go for, but we appreciate the demand very much and we'd like to fulfill that demand. I'd also say that there is an example, I believe it's in Norway or Sweden in our database, I think Norway, where you actually had people trying to break into prison to join exactly, a yeah. prisoner in prison, literally breaking into prison to join, a, I think, a conscientious objector against uh, service in the military. So there are examples uh, that Peter stated, as well as this one of people literally trying to break into jails to join <laughs> to join the resistors there. The, uh, I would add, yeah, there are many examples, even in, uh, I can cite one from an anti-corruption campaign in Bosnia and Herzegovina where um, youth made up t-shirts that said, arrest me, I, I wrote the graffiti. And then they flooded the police, uh, 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 the police uh, precinct with calls saying, arrest me, I flooded the graffiti. I mean, I, I wrote the graffiti. Uh, this was about a scandal over housing. Um, but I mean, I think this is, uh, Syed, what you've, what you've raised is really important that for, for you and for others to go back to the nonviolent nonviolence international database and see what you can add to it so you can add that historical context and all of us should be going and adding examples from bosnia herzegovina from the civil rights movement in the us from from india so that then people can can see the richness of how this has been used across different cultures for different kinds of struggles uh, so thanks very much for raising this uh, really important example from the um, independence movement uh, in uh, against uh, British colonial rule. May I make Thank a you. comment here? Go Would ahead. Be right? um, what I'm hearing in these questions is a search for the tactic that's sort of like the silver bullet. And it might exist or it might not. But let me talk about an exercise that I'm going to write about in my book that might very well be helpful. So to the last person who made the question, gather 10 or 15 of your friends and read all of Michael's list and have them each go away and write the 10 that they think would be most effective in your conflict. And to talk to each one of them and then to come back and explain to each one of the 10 or 15 why. And then what you'll do, if you have 10 or 15 people who've done this, in a in a in a uh, quiet atmosphere where nobody is sh shooting down anybody else's ideas you'll discover 
that there's a proclivity for five or 10 of these ideas that the group feels is the most, uh, is filled with the most potential. And then after you decide that or you find that grouping, talk to each other about how to implement them in your own context. And what you'll find is not only will you be able to rank the importance of these tactics, you'll be able to find out ways in which each of the tactics will supplement the effectiveness of the other. Great. Uh, so we've got. Okay, uh, Roger, when can we yes, expect Oscar. Peter's? Uh, now that we now that Peter has like stimulated all this interest for his yeah. uh, groundbreaking uh, book as well. Yeah, when, when put him we on the stage. We'll put him on the stage. Yeah, the, the the publication probably would be yeah. very soon, and then we'll put him on the stage to present. <laughs> okay. Peter? But you know, I uh, I stand on the shoulders of Michael because without Michael's work. What I'm writing about wouldn't be in a wouldn't be 33,000 words. It would be 330,000 words. So thank you again, Mike. Thank you. So we've got uh, we've got uh, some time for one more one more question, um, and I would like to ask uh, Eric uh, Baman uh, to uh, introduce uh, himself and ask the question. Eric, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, my name is Eric Bachman. I've been a nonviolence trainer since the 70s. And um, I really appreciate what you've done, Michael. This is a fantastic collection. Um, I have one question about developing it further, perhaps. Uh, I think all three of you mentioned how important is the context in which an action takes place. And then one action may be useful in one context, but not in another context. My question is, is there a place to provide that information in your database? Uh, about experiences of where an action worked well in a specific context, where it didn't work well in another context, in a way that it uh, might even be searchable. Because I think that would be very, very useful. Because in my trainings, I've often referred to actions. Here's one that worked very well. The same action in a different situation was a total uh, failure. And I think that information, I, I haven't looked at it briefly, and I haven't found a place to put it in there. But what are your plans, or what are your ideas on that? And if you have none, I'm suggesting you make some. This is a okay. brilliant, okay. brilliant, brilliant idea. Uh, we have no plans for that at the moment. We would need some significant funding and some great brain power of many of you on this call to try to figure out how we could how we could document that uh, well. And I think it's a it's a it's a it's a great idea. I just uh, I would point out to people that there is the Swarthmore campaign database of 1500 nonviolent campaigns that talks about lots and lots of tactics that can be used, but those are all successful ones. Uh, and it doesn't really, to a substantial degree, not all, but mostly successful ones. So um, it would be useful. Maybe people can get some information from the campaign uh, website. Uh, I would welcome Eric. Uh, your further work with me to tr and anybody else here to try to make that a reality. It's a great idea. Can I make a point about, about that great question? In, in the distinction that I make between nonviolent conflict over issues and nonviolent conflict over power, the latter is much more of a competitive dynamic where what the other side does materially impacts the nature of the tactic you use. So in the tennis metaphor, you can't have a tactical handbook of four hands because you don't know what the other guy and how he's going to, or woman is going to respond. I think that this, however, if you're talking about nonviolent conflict in social justice context, that might be an easier place to find consistency. And, and we might look for the answers that this gentleman is asking in those kinds of conflicts more easily. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, so I wish we had two hours at least for this webinar. Um, you cannot see what I what I see on my end. There are a lot of also questions that were submitted to us in written format. Uh, but uh, we are we came to to uh, you know to the end of that webinar. And uh, I would just ask I would like to ask each of you whether you would like to have uh, you know some concluding thoughts that you would like to you know share with the audience at this moment. Michael, you want to go? You want me? Who should go first? 
Uh, Shaska, perhaps we can start from you. Okay. Uh, Shaska, you need to unmute yourself. You got to unmute Shaska. I guess I, I guess my uh, my concluding thought is is a quick reflection on um, social justice and anti-corruption struggles versus uh, struggles against authoritarian regimes. Um, and maybe it's helpful to make a distinction in terms of um, a, a struggle against a, an authoritarian go, a regime uh, has a has a, quite a clear uh, defined adversary. In the social justice or anti-corruption struggle, the distinction is um, that the struggle is about uh, actually short-term objectives uh, many different kinds of short-term objectives, but longer-term transformation in terms of society, economics, um, political establishment, norms and attitudes. Um, though that, and and so in that in those longer-term struggles where you need to keep sustained uh, participation of many people uh, over you know uh, uh, for a long period of time. Um, I think Michael's distinctions between the constructive and the coercive are very helpful because it expands the universe of tactics that are needed to sustain a movement over many years, sometimes even decades. If we're looking at, for example, uh, women's rights, uh, race, uh, you know, racial equality, uh, anti-corruption. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Peter, you are muted. Um, okay. No, I'm, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, yes. One of the great friends of ICNC is an admiral named Jim Stravides, who was a four-star admiral, who was the uh, the supreme allied commander in Europe, the head of Southern Command. He ran a uh, aircraft carrier battle group. And I asked him a simple question. I said, Jim, you've been at this for 40 years. How much time were you spent in training? And education and how much time were you spent in operations and he said six hours of education and training for every one hour of operations look today we've had a proliferation of civil resistance movements for rights for whatever we define but the average person who's involved in them was a dentist ran a restaurant in the morning and is out there in the streets this this field is suffering from a massive shortage of training and touching people. ICNC every year maybe trains through online, offline, uh, 400 people. There needs to be ways to turn that number from 400 to 400,000. When you get to that kind of scale, things that we all desire in our societies will be much more easily attained. Michael, and uh, the last word is from you. Thank you everybody for coming and attending today. Uh, I really welcome feedback on the book. Uh, it's uh, we are always wanting to improve. I would reiterate uh, what Shaska says is that one of the contributions here is we are trying to highlight the power of constructive program. Gandhi was a genius. Uh, he he had his uh, eyes uh, uh, on the prize, and constructive uh, constructive kind of uh, actions. Uh, through appeals, refraining, and creative intervention uh, can really be extremely powerful uh, modes of, of acting uh, that can, can be disruptive and change the world uh, for the better. So we hope that uh, that will be done. I just also want to do a shout out that tactics education is very important. Uh, tactics don't just fail for strategic reasons and context reasons. They fail because people are not adequately trained in how to do uh, an action, which is very, can be very, very complicated. Do you, how do you do scouting? What kind of materials are you using? What are the, the specific um, uh, organizi uh, organizing of the different groups and within sequencing of even within your own one single uh, tactic? How are you sequencing events? How are you following up and declaring victory or, or evaluating those things? What kind of uh, sound system are you using? What kind of, 
power. You have to think like a theater director and you have to train people to do these things and to do them well. And so there's a lot of vast uh, need in terms of how to do a, a good hunger strike, how to do a good protest, how to do a good strike that will meet the needs of a particular situation. I only touch on some of this in the book, but there's a need in all of our uh, nonviolent education to be doing an enormous amount of hands-on training at the very grassroots level of how do you actually do a, a, a good, well-designed uh, uh, protest of some sort that can really have an impact. So uh, with that, uh, I look forward to working with all of you and thank ICNC for this phenomenal webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, our discussants, Peter and Shaska. It was uh, it was great to hear uh, every one of you. And um, I also thank our audience um, who stayed with us and asked terrific questions. So I would like to only remind everyone that uh, Michael's uh, monograph that was published by ICNC is available on the ICNC website for free download and that this webinar yes indeed we that's a great applause we have to have uh, for Michael and uh, ICNC as well for releasing that so uh, and um, that webinar uh, was also recorded and we'll be sending uh, the link to that uh, recording to everyone who registered for that webinar so you'll be able to you know review everything that you heard as well as um, access the, the slides uh, if you were interested. And um, I would like to ask Bruce only to show an impressive list of forthcoming webinars that we have for you. Uh, and um, uh, you can also access that list uh, on our ICNC website and we encourage you to register. We've got um, uh, close to 10 webinars forthcoming in the coming uh, months. Um, uh, from the authors that uh, are publishing different studies and monographs and special reports uh, with ICNC. So uh, we would, uh, we are welcome every one of you to, to join us and uh, uh, to be active participant in that webinar. So again, thank you for everyone. Thank you for the speaker, uh, for the speaker and for the discussions, for your feedback and uh, uh, engaging conversations and reflections. And I will see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.